Right, evening everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Engels Memorial Lecture. Um, we're just still waiting for some people to join us. Hang on. Yeah, he's in. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, my name is uh, Bob Kelly uh, and I'm a trustee of both the Marks Memorial Library and the Working Class Movement Library in Salford and I'm going to be your chair for tonight. Uh, I've been instructed um, uh, to give you some technical information um, and that's what's his name. If people could switch their cameras off, please. Um, some of this, I believe this uh, helps with the the bandwidth, whatever that is. Um, and also, um, uh, if you, we're hoping to take some questions at the end. Um, if you could pop the questions in the chat uh, facility, which is at the bottom of the, your screen, uh, then we will endeavour uh, to answer as many questions as we can uh, in the time available to us near the end. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, as as I just said, the the this lecture is being co-hosted by uh, the Working Class Movement Library and the Marx Memorial Library, and it's Engels that gives us uh, the link, if you like, to the two places, the two libraries, uh, because of course Engels lived and worked in Salford, um, and obviously he co collaborated with Marx, who was in London. Um, and of course, it's especially poignant that we're having this lecture um, this year uh, because, of course, it's Engels' 200th birthday. Um, and of course, he's often overshadowed uh, by Marx because Engels was an intellectual giant in his own right. Uh, so it's only right that we celebrate two of his seminal works uh, tonight. Um, and I'm so I'm delighted that we've got Mary Davis to speak tonight. Not only is she uh, a comrade and the secretary of the Marx Memorial Library, uh, but she's a professor of labour history and she is widely published on women's history, labour history, imperialism and racism. Um, so the screen is all yours, Mary. Oh, right. Now, I'm, I'm going to apologise in advance for any technological mishaps. Um, I hope they won't be political ones, but they might be technological ones. Right. OK, so um, today I want to look, um, as Bob said, about two, um, two of these books, The Condition of the Working Class in England, Nation Four, and Engels' Origin of Family Private Property in the State. And, uh, and, and also, it seems, I'm sure you'll have worked out, this is a rather unlikely relationship. Um, the first book was written by Engels in 1844, when he was only 24 years old. Um, the Origins was published um, 40 years later, um, when uh, Engels, uh, when Engels was, well, quite an old man, after Marx had died anyway. Now, the condition of um, the English working class is, I think, a, a masterly exercise in what would be called today by sociologists participant observation. Engel was the participant observer of the beginnings of industrial capitalism, and his book is a social observation of the effects of the devastating impact of the first stage of sta a phase of large-scale industry on women, on men, on women, and women and children, and their appalling housing conditions. Um, he, uh, the housing conditions were dreadful. He wrote about this, um, but Engels, uh, um, mind you, having said that, these housing conditions in, of the 1840s bear somewhat of a similarity to living conditions in 2020. I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, but Engels' book is much more than social observation. It is a pre-Marxist analysis of the development of capitalism, providing, as it did actually, primary source material and insights for uh, volume one of Capital, which was published in 1867. Engels discovered the concept and the meaning of exploitation, uh, the, the 
precise meaning, and he also explained for the first time the general law of capital accumulation. Conditions of the English working class is also an astute contemporary account of the conflict between capital and labour during this a, a phase of, well, actually with acute economic cyclical crises which characterised Britain's capitalist, capitalist economy uh, and certainly until the 1850s and the sort of workshop of the world phase. Engels noted and observed the militancy of the class struggle of those days in the early days of industrialization um, in response to, for example, the, uh, um, the campaign against the abolition uh, of the hated Poor Law Amendment Act, the movement for factory reform, and above all, um, in the 1842 Chartist General Strike, which I'm very pleased to see that um, the Thameside Metropolitan Borough Council has put a plaque up to it and does not call it, as was encouragingly called always, the plug riots. This was a general strike over uh, not quite 100 years before uh, the 1926 general strike. I wish I had time to say more about that, but I haven't. So now on to the origins of the family. Well, obviously, the subject matter is very different. Um, it's great. The great significance of, of this book um, is that it's one of the first Marxist analyses of the development of the family and the origins of women's oppression. It actually wasn't the first, Babel of Women and Socialism in 1879, but, uh, it, uh, but it's a subject in which most men, including socialist men, were deeply uninterested, and so it's very significant. Thus, the subject matter of origins is apparently very different to the first book. So you might say, well, why the hell is she trying to look at both books? Uh, isn't it invidious to compare them? There is a link, however, between the two books, and that resides in the analysis or the observation of the working class family in both books. And despite the fact that these books are separated by 40 years, there is a continuum in Engels' analysis of the working class family. And it's an analysis, actually, which I think is a weakness in both books. Well, I hope to explain that later. That's not to diminish the significance, however, um, of those books. So in terms of the origins of the family, um, its long title, Private Property, and I'm only going to consider the family in its relation to women's oppression. Now, a lot is made of the empirical shortcomings of the anthropological evidence uh, employed by Engels. I'm not going to enter into this discussion beyond stating that social anthropology has advanced since Morgan uh, wrote his major study of Native North Americans, uh, in the, uh, Native North Americans, I should say, um, that is to say his ancient society in 1977, and uh, the Swiss anthropologist Bachofen, uh, 1861, who wrote on Mother Right, Engels drew much of his empirical material from these two men. Um, some of this material may well be flawed, but um, however much there are anthropological criticisms, I don't, and there might well be, and I'm not an anthropologist, I don't think that those criticisms disprove Engels' underlying thesis, nor do they uh, undermine his historical method. So, um, his schema, as I say, was based uh, very much on Morgan and, and on Bachofen. Uh, he starts from, uh, Engels does, starts, uh, as, as does Morgan, from the position that pre-class subsistence societies were characterised by simple foraging, hunting and group marriage, different forms of group marriage, as you see from the slide. Tasks were, were carried out collectively and the products distributed among the group for immediate consumption. Now, this form of social organisation um, which he turned um, savagery and, and barbarism, savage societies and bar, um, bar, 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 barbarism societies, and was very much in line with the language of 19th century social anthropology. So don't, I'm not being an apologist for that. There was no, in those forms of societies, pre-class societies, there was no possibility of the private accumulation or appropriation of goods or labor women and men lived in relations of equality.
Mary, Mary, I'm really sorry, but you muted. You muted for some reason. So, where did that, did that just start? Did no, have to... you have to go. But you have to go back a little bit. Oh, where, where, where was I up to? When I didn't, I didn't even touch this one. Um, okay, so I'll start off with. Um, Basically, I'll start off with Engels again. Um, he Basically, what he's saying is that in pre-class societies, um, uh, there was subsistence, there was not a subsistence. They were characterised by simple foraging and hunting, and they were matrilineal societies, um, and the family form um, was based on di different, well, the consanguine family, the penalian fam family, pairing marriages, basically... Um, there were group marriages uh, in which men and women were, were equal, and they were, and they were matrilineal, i.e., um, uh, mother right uh, uh, pertain. Um, and I'm not sure where where I stopped. And I'm sorry if I don't know. But um, women's childbearing capacity um, influenced the development of a division of labour, in women, which women were primarily responsible uh, for childcare. Um, and men being more mobile tended to undertake the tasks associated with larger game hunting, food gathering at further afield and so on. Women control the instruments of domestic production while men control the instruments of hunting and warfare. Far from being support, subordinate, again, I have to stress, or Engel stresses, there's powerful evidence suggests that women's role was crucial in the development of skills and knowledge central to the advancement of human social organization. Uh, and uh, uh, tools, utensils, and so on. Um, so there was a division of labor by sex in pre-class societies, um, but women's work was not regarded as inferior to that of men, as it is in class society. So the movement from simple um, subsistence to the production of a surplus laid the material basis for the development of trade, the appropriation of labour, particularly the labour of slaves, and the concept of private property. Uh, the, uh, so basically, um, the development of plant and animal husbandry and more complex instruments of production, which could have reduced the sexual division of labour, but it didn't. Um, the emergence of class societies, uh, with the emergence of class societies, came a deepening of the division, the sexual division of labour, and the attribution of an inferior status to women's work. Uh, and that really resulted in the overthrow of mother right, which, as you see, uh, uh, Engels termed the world historic defeat of the female sex. And precisely how this happened um, is, as Engel says, unknown, it's prehistoric. The patriarchal family emerged slowly, first within tribes or clans, and then more rapidly as monogamy developed. From the patrilineal clan system, which the later stage of barbarism, that comparing marriage, you could see that that was happening, um, emerged the... Uh, 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 the, the from the patri uh, sorry, from the patrilineal patrilineal clans that emerged in the patriarchal family in which a monogamous marriage and the patrilineal principles of inheritance formalized the complete subject of women. This is Engels. The only way in which paternity could be guaranteed was through the sequestration of women and their enforced sexual fidelity. Sexual fidelity, of course, only applied to women, not to men. Marriage was not based on what Engels termed sex love. Men found that elsewhere but it was based purely on property and the need for procreation. And with monogamy and men's position, dominant position, prostitution emerged to satisfy men's sexual desires as a big chunk of this in, in Angles. Um, in the patriarchal clan system, such male desires were satisfied through concubines. So men's rights uh, uh, were, were rigid to the fore. Monogamy was the only way to ensure that private property was passed through the male line to sons, they were almost always sons, of undisputed parentage. And that's the key thing. It's the property relationship through, through the male line, the undisputed parentage, actually, this is where. 
um, well, well, that's where the whole um, chastity belts and all the rest of it emerge in the Middle Ages. But to, to, to carry on, uh, for Engels, the patriarchal monogamous nuclear family represented the perfected, didn't really mean perfect, but perfected form of marriage for the transmission of property and the institutionalization of controls over women, uh, uh, over women by men. And as he puts it in this famous phrase, the first class antagonism which appears in history coincides with the development of the antagonism between man and woman in monogamous marriage, and the first class oppression with that of the female sex by the male. So therefore Engels identifies two world historic defeats for women. One is the ending of mother right, and the other is the oppression uh, of women by men in the monogamous fam nuclear family, in which the husband is the bourgeois and the wife is the proletarian. Again, a, a, another famous quote from Engels. So thus it's clear that the oppression of women and class exploitation appear in history coincidentally, not causally, but coincidentally, because of their common origin in the development of private property. The accumulation of wealth under private ownership was the material basis for the establishment of class society and the material basis for the oppression of women by the men who controlled that wealth. The ways in which different forms of class society, slavery, feudalism, and capitalism have oppressed women have assumed uh, various historical forms, as has the precise nature of class exploitation. Not nearly enough is known about the position of women within slave and feudal societies, although it's clear that their status was subordinate to that of men. More is known about the oppression of women within capitalist society, especially industrial capitalism, of course, which Britain was the forerunner. Engels argued that the emancipation of women lay in the possibility of, in, of their involvement in social production. That is, women's entry into paid work, he thought, would decrease their isolation and financial uh, dependence on men and bring them into contact with the trade union labor movement. Because he saw the monogamous family as the instrument for the transmission of, pro of, of property, Engels believed that it would not survive amongst work, the working class for whom there was no property to transmit. However, herein lies the big problem, which I hope to discuss um, later, i.e. the problem of what happens and what is happening to the working class family. Engels was deeply committed to the principle of equality for women. He recognized that advances for women um, of what possible within capitalism, but saw full emancipation uh, uh, as only possible um, uh, in a socialist society uh, in which there was political and social um, and economic freedom. So what happens next? Well, Engels might have um, been forgotten, um, not by us, but it might have been forgotten, were it not for the fact that in the 60s and 70s, uh, we witnessed the burgeoning of a, uh, of a new women's movement, the second, phase, uh, the second wave women's movement, or the women's liberation movement. And with that movement, uh, there was a, a, um, a concerted attempt to understand um, the origins of women's oppression. It was recognized, but why did it happen? Why did, um, and why did it come about? And in this context, in this, this new women's movement uh, in the 60s and 70s, Engels was hotly debated. Many criticisms uh, were launched against Engels' work. Um, some are valid, others were and are mere anti-Marxist cant. Um, I'm not going to deal with the cant, but some of the arguments that I've summarised in the origins of the family have actually been widely misinterpreted um, and um, have given a sort of, a, I would say, a theoretical underpinning for many non-Marxist analysis. I only want to look at one of these, uh, what I consider to be significant misinterpretations, um, and that is the, the, uh, the very prevalent one and actually uh, quite challenging one. And um, this is the so-called dual systems theory. Now, many socialist feminists have used Engels to support their argument that women's oppression and class oppression are two separate systems. And they cite this statement 
from Engel's original family as their proof. This statement, oh, I'm sorry about this. Um, yes. Um, I've put it up because it does uh, require um, a bit of consideration. So according to the materialist conception, the determining factor of history is in the final instance, the production and reproduction of immediate life. This again is a, um, is a twofold character. On the one side, the production of the means of existence of food, of clothing and shelter, and the tools necessary for that production. On the other side, the production of human beings themselves, the propagation of the species. The social organization under which the people of a particular historical epoch and a particular country live is determined by both kinds of production. The stage of development of labor on one hand and the family on the other. Well, that, um, that has been, uh, in uh, sorry, let me just, that's been uh, um, interpreted as saying that there are two motives to history, the class struggle and the sex struggle. The site of the former, that is the, the, the class struggle, is the mode of production. We would all agree with that. And they, but then they say the site of the latter, the second one, um, uh, is, uh, that is the sex struggle, is the mode of reproduction. Now, Engels, I think that Engels' statement can only be read ambiguously if it's read in isolation from his and uh, works and from Marx's other works. Uh, Engels is clear that the oppression of women, the institution of the family, and all social relations must be dealt with in class terms, i.e. relations um, to um, specific modes of production. However, um, dual systems theory has led to a separation uh, between these two modes, and you can see why from that quote that I just gave you, production and reproduction. And in practice, that attempt to separate these two modes of production has led to a number of erroneous theories, um, so neo-Marxist, but supposedly, not, I would say non-Marxist, uh, leading to mis uh, misconceived practices. So for example, uh, um, just to run through a few of them, um, sex, if sex struggle and male supremacy are universal, which is what, what is implied by the dual systems theory, and that they're autonomous, um, they either exist alongside or even instead of class struggle. Now that obviously then gives um, a theoretical uh, 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 justification for separatism because What's needed if women are to be liberated is a movement of all women to overthrow male supremacy. That would solve it. Um, this, this dual systems uh, theory also, I think, has led to um, the view that women can be used as a sex class, of, uh, as a sex class, you see this term quite often, unrelated to the means of production, which is a complete misunderstanding of what class is, in my opinion. Um, but it's it, women as a sex class um, um, basically implies that reproduction is seen as a mode of production which men own. Women are commodities producing use values, i.e., domestic labor, and exchange value in the form of reproducing the next generation of labor power as well as maintaining the existing labor force. From all of this uh, emerged a, a massive debate uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s, the so-called domestic labour debate, and its offshoot of that was the demand for wages for housework, which I haven't got time to go into, but um, I think it's clearly incorrect because it doesn't understand uh, the, what, what a wage is, uh, but that's another story. Now, two Marxist feminists have, from different perspectives, been at the forefront of rebutting uh, dual, uh, the dual systems misrepresentation of Engels. Uh, Martha Gimenez in uh, Women, um, Marx Women and, uh, and Marx Women, Marx Women and Capitalist Social Reproduction, 
one of her books, um, Lisa Vogel in Marxism and the Oppression of Women Towards a Unitary Theory. You can see the point about unitary theory, i.e. in opposition to, uh, uh, to the dualism. Um, those authors, uh, Vogel and Wimner, uh, um, are highly critical of Engels for not applying for what they say he, he doesn't do. He doesn't apply historical and dialectical materialism rigorously, in particular um, because they say he fails to establish the relationship between the twofold character of production and reproduction. And it's his fault, therefore, because he didn't uh, articulate the relationship uh, that, that then opened the way for the dual system's misconstruction. Now, it's my contention here that Engels did not and could not have subscribed to a dual, to dual systems theory. Um, nonetheless, the debate around the issue um, was, has given rise to an examination of two, I think, extremely important questions, one of which uh, Engels didn't address adequately, and the other, I think he got completely wrong. So I want to look at these two, these two questions. First of all, Engels' um, omissions, let's say omissions, uh, uh, um, or at least it, an inadequate addressing of an issue. And that is to say, the first thing is this, this social reproduction and domestic labor. So th this is the first question that he didn't address, um, is the role of domestic labor as a compo component of what, of socially necessary labor. Now Marx gives us the clue to understanding domestic labor as a component of social reproduction when he defines the capitalist wage system as, to quote him, the monetary the wages, wages are the monetary expression of the value of labor power. That value of labor power, i.e. wages, is determined by the amount of socially necessary labor time required for the production and reproduction of the laborer. So there are two elements into socially necessary labor time, SNLT, the maintenance of labor and the production of the next generation. There are two aspects. This is not dualism, this is aspects of socially necessary labor time and that this entails uh, two things one is the essential function of the daily revival of the male laborer this entails his eating sleeping watching over his health just unwinding to replenish his family in order to work effectively the next day for this his wife, and it usually is his wife or a woman, cooks his food, cleans his house and clothing and provides nurture. So that is to do with the, the maintenance of the labourer. The labourer has to eat in order to live and has to be clothed and all the rest of it. The second aspect of socially necessary labour is the replacement of one generation of workers by the next, by the workforce by the next. And this obviously entails a woman's biological role in giving birth and her social uh, and her social role in rearing children. Now, both these tasks are performed typically, but not always, in a monogamous nuclear family. The socially necessary labour time is important in another respect. It gives rise to what we now term the family wage, the family wage paid to the male breadwinner. Within a nuclear family, the full wage for the production and reproduction of human life is only given to one member, the man who is seen as the male breadwinner. A man can't re reproduce home human life, only a woman can. So although women enter the labor market and sell their labor power for a wage, they do so under less favorable conditions than men due to their biological function of bearing and rearing future generations. For women, this presents the contradiction between their role in the public sphere of production and in the private sphere of the reproduction uh, of reproduction and domestic labor. And this is the reason for unequal pay. In the former, uh, i.e. In, in the sphere of, the, 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 the sphere of uh, production, um, they produce use values, uh, sorry, and I think the other way around, um, 
the, in, in the private sphere of reproduction, they produce use values for which they're not paid. And in the latter, they produce exchange value for which they are always paid less than men. Now, Marx understood this when he noted that cotton manufacturers preferred to use the labor of women with children. Why? Because the mill owner could pay them less than men and they would accept it precisely because they're women with dependent children. In one of the most telling pieces of contemporary evidence, uh, James Mitchell, a, factory, uh, factor, uh, a, fa a British factory commissioner, unwittingly revealed um, a, a <laughs> before Marx, a Marxist analysis of the fact and the purpose of the super exploitation um, of women. In 1833, he wrote, some persons feel much regret at seeing the wages of females so low, but perhaps such persons are wrong and nature affects her own purpose more wisely and more effect effectually than could be done by the wisest of men. The low price of female labor makes it the most profitable as well as the most agreeable occupation uh, for a female to superintend her own domestic establishment and her low wages um, do not tempt her to abandon the care of her own children. Uh, so he, he's making the connection as a factory inspector that the low price of labour is precisely related to their role in domestic production and that's why they get that low, low wage. And in, in the condition uh, of the English working class, Engels does come close to recognising this but misunderstands its significance as we shall, uh, as we shall see. Um, it should be noted here uh, that women are not um, and a, a reserve, and never were a reserve army. They were the first factory workers. Um, the conditions, uh, 1844 notes this, um, uh, uh, and subsequently women have always worked because the so-called family wage is a myth and has never been enough to sustain a so-called typical family, let alone an atypical one. But the myth of the family wage i.e. the wage paid to the male breadwinner for the reproduction and production of human life, um, persisted as an ideological construct, which has penetrated into labour movement thinking um, really from the 1850s onwards with the rise of the labour aristocracy and the trade union acceptance of unequal pay, a marriage bar and the notion of the male breadwinner. Um, we could discuss that a bit, a bit more, but in fact, uh, that was the basis for the exclusion of women by better paid men, male workers from the workforce. Now, I want to come uh, um, uh, deal now with what I consider to be an error that Engels made, and this is in relation uh, to the working class family. I hinted at that before. <coughs> As we've seen, um, Engels' theory of the family and women's oppression is based on the notion that the monogamous nuclear family emerged in class society because of the need to ensure that property owned by the male was passed to sons of undisputed parentage. Now, of course, that makes an awful lot of sense for those who have property, i.e. the bourgeois family. But how could this then apply to the propertyless working class family who own nothing but their labor power which they're forced to sell for a wage. Well, Engels assumed that the working class monogamous family would disappear, uh, as we've seen, because there was no material basis, I, that is to say property, for its existence. Now, of course, that wasn't the case and it is not the case. Engels couldn't explain the survival of the working class family <coughs> because of his failure to appreciate the impact on the working on the working class itself, of ruling of the ruling of ruling class ideology, and in particular, um, a ruling class ideology of uh, the family, the deeply impregnated notion of sexism and family values, and this was a major major aspect of ruling class ideology, from I would say the dawn of class society, uh, but certainly under capitalism. Um, he observed, Engels observed, that he didn't analyse the subordinate status of working class women within the workplace and in the family. In fact, in conditions, he seems um, to blame working women for the neglect of children and for what he, um, <laughs> for what he thought was um, the immoral behaviour of unmarried women. In conditions, he notes, 
that in flax, in flax spinning mill, uh, mills, over 70% of the workers are women. And that uh, this has ruinous consequences uh, for, um, <coughs> uh, for uh, I'm quoting him, ruinous consequences for the workers because the employment of women at once breaks up the family. He says, the family is not dissolved, but is turned upside down. He's talking about role reversal in the family, where the women uh, uh, work and the men uh, um, are, are left at home. He's actually talking about hand and weavers uh, in this case. But basically he says that um, uh, uh, the, with the family being turned upside down and role reversal, there is disastrous impact on infant mortality and on uh, extremely low life expectancy, I mean, incredibly low in, in the 1830s in Manchester, 17 was a good age to live. He notes that this, what he calls unsane state of things, unsexes the man and takes from the woman all womanliness. And he appears therefore, Engels appears to um, agree with the factory commissioner for Lancashire, a man called Dr. Hawkins, who hopes that the time may come in which married women will be shut out of factories. Um, so he, and of course that certainly didn't happen. Um, so I don't think, in addition to this, which you could say was the product of you know, a 24 year old man not fully comprehending what he was seeing and being part of the kind of ideology that was so prevalent at the time, Nonetheless, uh, in origins, 40 years later, um, it's clear to me that, that he did not, Engels didn't take account of a, of a number of things. First of all, the role that the family unit plays in the reproduction and maintenance of labour power, which I've mentioned before. Secondly, the role of the family as an economic unit, which not only fills the capitalist fundamental need for the reproduction of labour power, but the family-based division of labor also enables capitalism keep, to keep down the social wage. Um, doesn't, they don't have to spend so much money on public services like childcare, education, health care. So the family as an economic unit is important. But the family also as a, a unit of consumption is vitally important um, because basically what the vital aspect of capitalism is the fact that workers um, use the wages that they earn to purchase the commodities they produce. So Engels' um, incorrect formulation of, uh, of, of what, what I think was the incorrect formulation of working class family in 1844 was repeated in the origins. Although he does, I think, 40 years on, acknowledge some of the contradictions. And I just quote this from the origins, chapter two. Not until the coming of modern large scale industry was the road to social production open to her again, Mr. Woman, um, and then only to the proletarian wife. But it was opened in such a manner that if she carries out her duties in the private service of her family, she remains excluded from public production and unable to earn if she wants to take if she, if she wants to take part in public production and earn independently she cannot carry out family duties. Well, actually she can and she did. So I want just now to update this a little bit by women workers um, and the family today. Modern large scale industry and women's entry into social production has not solved anything for working class women. In fact, it has exacerbated the unresolved contradiction, which Engels noted just now in the quote I just read, um, the unresolved contradiction between work and home, public and private. Unequal pay was and has remained a feature of women's employment uh, in capitalist society. Apart from pay inequality, the other important fact of women's employment in the period of industrial capitalism and today was and is the phenomenon of job segregation. The existence of women's jobs in inverted commas within the labour market will surely disprove the myth that women workers are a transitory element uh, of the capitalist workforce, con constituted some kind of industrial reserve army to be called to the colours when male labour is scarce, as in times of war. 
Although um, the, uh, the example of women workers um, in the cotton factories um, was cited earlier, such work um, was actually the exception rather than the norm. And around, uh, uh, um, and around uh, much interest at the time, Victorian blue books, for example, um, uh, precisely for this reason, what women's very public role in these kind of industries, um, cotton industry in particular, lay bare in a very visible manner the contradiction um, uh, in the moral notion of the sanctity of the family and women's place within it as against the drive of capitalism to employ uh, exploit a section of the workforce which had which were rendered vulnerable precisely because of domestic responsibilities. The super exploitation of women workers existed outside factory production and has remained and still does much more hidden from public scrutiny and hence largely ignored. Apart from cotton textiles um, and pottery, women were not to be found in large numbers in many of the other factory-based industries as they developed during the course of the 19th century. And domestic work uh, was a major employer of women. In fact, taken as a whole, women factory workers remained a small minority of the female population. The vast majority of women workers will be were and still are to be found in more hidden areas of work, domestic service, as, as you see, uh, the sweated trades um, and homework in various kinds in small sweated workshops and such trades as lace making, glove making, straw plaiting, millinery. A similar kind of sexual division of labour can be found in Britain today where women workers are clustered in a narrow range of women's jobs, kind of amongst them being clerical work, shop work, uh, 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 textile work, caring, cleaning, catering. And two, two factors uh, characterize this sexual division of labor historically and currently. First, these jobs are always very low paid. And secondly, that much of this work represents an extension of women's work within the family. In other words, the centuries-old division of labour within the family, which predates capitalism, as we've seen, has been transferred from the realms of the private household to social production. This partly explains why women's skills within these jobs have been and continue to be so undervalued and thus underpaid. Given the undervaluation of women's work within the home, it's hardly surprising that when similar tasks are transferred to social production, their undervaluation persists. This attitude is reinforced by the belief that women's jobs are somehow peripheral to the economy and hence uh, can be fitted in uh, with uh, women's role in the home. The prevalence of part-time work for women is made to appear as a great concession by capital to enable uh, women workers to perform their dual responsibilities. In reality, it's nothing of the sort. Part-time work for women uh, um, accounts for a staggering 44% of female labor in Britain today, the highest by far of any European country. Far from being a kindly concession, um, it's an important device uh, to allow the maximum flexibility of the female labor force at the minimum possible cost in terms of employment rights, job opportunities and pay and also minimal cost to the neoliberal state's constant reduction of the social wage. In other words, women supposedly can combine their two functions um, uh, within the home and within social production if they work part time and kill themselves in the process. Historically, the trend towards part time work for women coincided with the social reforms implemented after the Second World War, and this may seem paradoxical, but it can be explained by the fact that the benefit system was based on the presupposition that everybody is a member of a family which is looked after by a male breadwinner, hence women's contributions less than men and what women take up less than men. Um, women shouldn't need to go out and anyway shouldn't want to because their place is in the home. So how, uh, however, while um, ideology um, decreed that women's place within the home, the labour market determined otherwise. Women's work is needed 
In fact, today, the female employment rate has reached a record high of 72.4% in December 2019. Um, but half of it, as I said before, on part-time casual or zero hours contracts. The preponderance of such contractual uh, uh, arrangements is frequently justified in the name of flexibility. They're commended to one as being family friendly. Part-time work is a family friendly policy. In fact, the opposite is true. Uncertainty about a regular source of income together with poverty wages and lack of affordable childcare increases the burden on women and perpetuates a cycle of deprivation. So, the phenomenal form of the working class family may have changed since 1844, but its role and function remains the same, especially in relation to women. Capitalism hasn't solved, nor does it wish to resolve, the essential contradiction between women's role in the family in the sphere of, of the private sphere of domestic reproduction and her role in the labour market, in the public sphere of social production, we don't need a dual systems theory to explain this. The capitalist mode of production is the system, it, that is a unitary system. Capitalism is dependent on the super exploitation and oppression of women. Its clever ideological role is to mask the contradictions. The role of Marxists is to reveal them. Engels has started this process. He couldn't be expected to say it all. This is our job, so just very briefly to return to Engels on his 200th birthday, at least in two days time it is. So despite my criticisms of one aspect of his work, well, that is to say on the working class family and women's place within it, his contribution overall is immense. The two works that I've concentrated on represent a fraction of his total output, but the origins of the family may not have given um, us all the answers, but he's certainly given us some tools to help posit the correct questions. Engels' lasting contribution is he's opened the way to construct a Marxist theory of the origins of women's oppression, which overcomes the gross limitations of empiricist and idealist perspectives. We must build on this. Wonderful, Mary. Thank you. Um, it's certainly given me the appetite to uh, return to the original books and read them again. Well, thanks for that. Um, we have got some uh, questions in the chat um, and we, uh, if people want to um, put some more in, they're welcome and if we've got the time, we will take them. So you you ready for some questions, Mary? Oh, yeah. Can I drink water first, please? Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> okay. Ready. Okay, we've got... Um, We've got a couple of, we've got two questions from Shireen, to be very greedy. Um, um, she says that, why has materialist feminism all but disappeared from view? Sorry, why? Materialist feminism all but disappeared from view. And would a resurgence of the discussion of materialist feminism and its application to current conditions help us to find a way through the current crisis of women's rights and the attempted replacement of sex by gender identity. Can we take a couple more just so I can get my breath back? <laughs> yeah, just hang on a sec. I'll just scroll down and I'll get them. Uh, yeah, I've got one from Vivian. Um, and she's asking, could mill owners have envisaged, envisaged, say it properly, that the machinery could be operated by women just as well as men and by giving opportunities to women become, be, women became early feminists? Sorry, I don't quite understand. Okay. Could mill owners have envisaged, envisaged, see, I can't, still can't say, that the machinery could be operated by women just as well as men and by giving opportunities to women, uh, could they become early feminists? I think that's what she means. Did you get that? No. Well, I think so. Okay. Do you want any more? Yeah. Just one more. Okay. Let me see what we've got. Not sure. 
Okay, I've got one here. Um, would you agree that there was a tendency uh, of feminists in the past to see all women, women as one homogenous group? And clearly they're not race, sexuality, etc. How do we in how do we and now feel a question of difference between women in respect to class? Hold on. Uh, was A, recognised by Engels, and B, recognised in this talk in respect to gender and class. For example, middle-class women and better access to education and childcare. Okay. Shall I go? Yeah. Oh. Um, right. Um, on the first question, why has a materialist feminist analysis Oh, I wish I knew. That's what we've got to pay attention to and build it, because um, if, if we don't, then I think we can, we are in danger of being almost eradicated as, as a sex. The gender, um, the gender identity debate is, is, can happen, fine, but we need to debate about women and women's oppression. I think this um, re-looking at Engels gives us the chance to do that. If you ask me why um, it's disappeared, I think it's because um, we haven't paid nearly enough ten attention to theory. The, the, whatever happened in the 60s and 70s, I mentioned, you know, the, the emergence of a women's movement and a lot of the theories were bonkers, but there was an attempt, at least a grand narrative, I think the part of the problem for us today is that we need to build a women's movement and we haven't got one. We've got fragments of bits and pieces of one, but that's what's, what's, uh, what's necessary. But alongside that, um, I think has to come um, a, 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 re a real reworking and looking um, at a, a materialist feminist analysis. And that means um, an understanding of Marxism, which is what basically our two libraries tried to do in their own ways, the Marx Memorial Library and the Working Class Movement Library. That's what we have to do. I mean, I'm just talking about getting back to basics. Marx and Engels didn't say it all. I mean, I tried to say that. What we have to do is to renew um, Marxism in the 21st century, building on the insights of historical and dialectical materialism. But that that means looking at some of the issues which Marx and Engels either didn't deal with fully, how could they, they can't do everything, um, uh, or, or, they, or, or we might want to not revise them, but use those methods. So um, I, I'm, I haven't answered the question fully, but I think this is a major question that has to be asked and re-asked and answered many times. The, the, the mill owners of the 19th century um, did prefer using women um, because they could pay them less. Um, the, the, they came up against the problem that um, the employment of women um, under the conditions that they were working, pit pitiful conditions they were working, was having a very de deleterious effect on the working class family in the sense that one of the reasons for um, shocking infant mortality rates is that women often were ha had to give uh, ha uh, had to give birth on the factory floor. There were no there was no safe substitute for breast milk. Um, but women went were back at work within a day of confinement. Well, they weren't confined. I mean, they just had their babies and carried on working. The only um, what the substitute for breast milk um, was <laughs> there wasn't one. But what what infants were given to the care of old relatives uh, was uh, water laced with laudanum and that kept them quiet forever often. Um, so they came smack up against this problem and um, uh, uh, Marx talks about it in, uh, in, in volume one of Capital when he looks look, look at the working day. Capital, capitalism left to its own devices would have actually um, uh, burnt out and destroyed a uh, 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 the, the, their own generation of labour power. The state, even in laissez-faire Britain, where you know the state wasn't supposed to intervene at all, they had to intervene um, and to pass factory legislation to stop the the rapacious mill owners from actually destroying their own labour force, or at least the next generation of it. So, 
uh, that's one of the reasons why, in a way, um, the, the ideology of the family led to um, women being hidden from hidden from history, actually hidden from view. They carried on working, but in much less uh, obvious and visible areas of work. And of course, on, on, the, on the question of women, women one are not a homogenous group, obviously not. I would argue that all women are oppressed, but not all women are exploited. Only women who have to sell their labor power for a wage are exploited. And the problem that we've got is um, a notion of feminism which thinks that somehow or other that uh, if you if a few more women uh, get, uh, break through the glass ceiling um, for example to have a woman as a prime minister or someone as a news reader or in a high throat suddenly somehow or other that benefits all women it doesn't and it doesn't at all and um, of course we shouldn't see women as a homogenous group the key thing for us is to understand that the basis of all oppression is class exploitation. And uh, unless we can see that actually whatever the, whatever the um, gains that people think we've made, i.e. we've got since Engels Day, we have got the right to vote, we have got the right to, um, to education and go to universities and all the rest of it, yes, but that doesn't mean that we can, uh, we're liberated. Actually, women's liberation fully can only take place uh, in, um, in a socialist society. That's why we want to have to be socialist. So um, not all women, especially women who own property, and they do, um, would agree with us on that. Okay, we've got some more. You ready for some more? Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I've got a, we've got a comment with a question in it. So comment is perhaps the destruction of the family as a site for effective relations for the working class might account for the fact that defending the family has become an important aspect of working class ideology. I.e. it's more complicated than ruling class ideology. Would you agree? Um, Do you want to answer that? I'm not sure I understood. The, uh, so, what, is the question saying that we, therefore we should defend the family because it's under attack? Or I'm not. I'm not. Don't think I understood the question. Okay, it's, it, it's saying perhaps the destruction of the family as a site for effective relations for the working class might account for the fact that defending the family has become an important aspect of working class ideology i.e. it's more complicated than ruling class ideology. Would you agree? I think, I think that I think that they're asking about whether or not what's name is that why, why would working class people defend the family as a group, maybe? Uh, I don't think that what... It's not a question of... <laughs> It's not a question of attacking or defending the family. It's a question of analysing its role and the role of women in it. Um, that's that, that's I don't think that's the, the issue. Um, and of course we would everybody wants to defend um, a, a, everybody wants to, to defend the kind of uh, any sort of loving relationship that they've got. Um, but the, the problem is to uh, um, see what the, the role the role of the family um, is, is one thing, and to analyze that correctly, I think is one thing. That doesn't mean to say that you attack or that, that you, you defend or, or, or support it. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that analyzing the function of the family implies either one thing or the other. Um, what I think that the, 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 the ideology of the family, which is used by the ruling class, is completely specious because they always talk about working families and working this and working that, and yet, um, uh, and family-friendly policies, um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, you know, they, they elevate this, but what is an ideological construct into something which it absolutely isn't. I mean, what 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 is a family? It is, uh, actually, this is such a big question. I, I, I think this is, we could have another talk on just on this. Is it the role of the of the working of the of of, so, of socialists to defend the family? Question mark. 
But if I if I was to go on, I, th I think this would 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 see out the rest of this session. So I, I think we should have another talk, another discussion on this. Okay, we're we're getting lots of questions in, so apologies if I'm not taking your question, but I'm going to um, <clears throat> not ask similar questions that Mary's already answered. Um, but there's one question here um, which says, uh, did, did Engels speak to or against um, the British trade union move, movement in position of maintaining the predominance of the male worker, male sphere of industry of a women's role? Um, <laughs> did he? Uh, well, he did say that he thought that the um, English working class was becoming as bourgeois as the bourgeoisie. I mean, he he quite lamented the um, the way the, the the I mean, if if you look at British Labour history, you could see that in the period that where he was a young man um, in Manchester, um, and when he wrote the, the conditions of, of the English working class, that was a sort of pretty revolutionary period in terms of working class struggle with with Chartism, with all the movements that, that were going on, the formation of early unions. Things began to change in the 1850s when the British economy had sort of leveled out um, and Britain was now the workshop of the world. And that gave rise to um, a, a, what, what Lenin called uh, the labor aristocracy, who, who the people who formed the so-called new model unions based on the model of the amalgamated engineering society of engineers better paid workers, there was a visible and physical difference between uh, the, those workers um, uh, who very much identified um, with, with the system in a way, I suppose you could say. This was the, the phenomenon of liberalism. That's what and Engels sort of noticed, noted that uh, the fact that by 1867, these the labor aristocrats, these better paid workers, mainly workers who were involved in the export trades, manufacturing the export trades, staple industries, um, they got the vote in 1867. They didn't um, set up their own party. They voted liberal, hence the phenomenon of liberalism. So he's, he said to, in a left to Marx that the English ruling class, has, uh, no, the, the, the English society has got the most uh, successful bourgeoisie and that has now managed to spread bourgeois ideas to the workers. Then, of course, by the 1880s, at the time that he was writing The Origins, there was a bit of a turnaround um, and uh, unions were developed um, um, uh, among, or were being developed amongst semi-skilled and unskilled workers. And this is where he participated in the struggle with Eleanor Marx um, and unions, very different sorts of unions were formed. Did he particularly comment on the on their attitude to women. He did in, in letters, I can't quote them, um, but um, this, this um, basically in the skilled trades, which the new model unions were, women were completely excluded, completely excluded, and completely excluded from the trade union movement. So by implication, the struggles of the post the 1880s onwards included women. So uh, he certainly wasn't happy about uh, women's exclusion from trade unions at all, uh, or the phenomenon of liberalism. Okay, uh, I've, got, I've got one here, which is a uh, more general one about culture. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent does the loss of a shared culture have on the building of a momentum of movements? Uh, by sheer culture, I mean the advent of social media and the ability to walk through life with no awareness of anything beyond the news feed. And they acknowledge the assumption that when everyone only had a radio or a couple of TV channels, that meant a shared culture and awareness. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a question for a... Ooh, We've got five uh, minutes. The cultural theorist. Really. <laughs> um, I mean, the problem is that we haven't got a shared cut. I'm always a little bit concerned about questions like this because it, it doesn't recognise, I think, the fact that um, there's a, there is, a, we are controlled through the ideological apparatus of the state. We, we, our own culture has been completely 
what what culture we have there's been a concerted attempt to smash it you know if you think about just the folk tradition we don't have that we don't have you know any kind of um those the kind of songs that were sung you know all, all of that's gone basically the the, the, the the ideological apparition of the state, which consists of the media, the 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 uh, everything that we, the, the education system, all of these things, and now social media, which we don't control. The only thing we've got is our own paper, and that's got got pitifully few read, well, pitifully few readers, not enough readers, I should say. So I I I don't think there is a sh there is a shared culture. But it's not our culture. It's the culture that's been imposed on us, um, and that's the problem. I don't know how we resolve that, um, uh, other than through uh, working class organisations. But even so, we have. There's always a struggle within those for um, to, to to get an acceptance of our ideas. So shared culture. I don't. Is, is not a culture that I share because it's not mine, it's theirs and it's imposed. I don't think that answers the question at all, but still. Okay, Mary. Um, <clears throat> we've got um, one um, which I think is an important question. Um, we seem to encounter an insurmountable get me where it sounds, obstacle in that left-wing organisations are largely controlled by men. Hmm. Many, many of these men are hostile to any analysis which names them as oppressors. Are we resigned to a watered-down class reductionist feminism which criticises capitalism but not men's role in the perpetuation of material and ideological sexism? Well, absolutely right. <laughs> so this is where I came in. I mean, when, when in this, this sort of second wave women's movement, that was the whole problem, wasn't it? You know, that the role of a revolutionary woman is to wash a revolutionary man's socks. In other words, that, you know, class, uh, the, the, the uh, struggle against women's oppression was really not it. This was, it was subordinate to the class struggle and it based on a complete misunderstanding of what class is and where women fit, women aren't a class, but women, like men, belong to a class, and the vast majority of women do belong to the working class. And you can't achieve, you know, the slogan of the tra of trade unions is always uh, unity is strength. Well, who are we uniting with? I mean, the fact is that the British labour movement throughout its history until, I would say, the 1960s was totally male-dominated, totally. We campaigned and battled for years, um, and we're still campaigning and battling to have a, 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 a greater visibility or higher profile of women within the trade union movement, but not just for women who want to pull up the drawbridge after them. What we're seeing, I think, is, is um, within the trade union movement now is actually going backwards on the women's question. Um, uh, that, that uh, under the cover of a sort of a generic equality scene, which has all sorts of disadvantaged inadvertent groups competing for scarce resources in this uh, in this sort of kind of miasma of an equalities agenda, whatever that's supposed to mean. We are actually half the human race. We're over half of the workforce. We, there's no special pleading to include women. There can't be any progress without women. And I do think that it's it's absolutely correct to say that many that men have lots of men, not every, not all men, have simply not understand the importance of ensuring that women uh, the, the struggle of women is part is part of the struggle. There won't be any, every socialist should be a feminist. But I'm not saying that every feminist should be a socialist. I'd like that to be the case, but you can't call yourself a socialist unless you're a feminist. And more men understand this and recognize it um, and not have to be browbeaten to, uh, to, to, uh, to say this. We have to get past this thing that somehow or other uh, women's struggle is an adjunct or is is not is 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 um is not part of the struggle. We have to redefine class struggle in a way which understands the absolutely integral and imperative role of women within it and black people come to mind. 
in other words, to recognize that the way in which capitalist exploitation is maintained is through oppressing the most visible groups of workers. Those most visible groups are women because of their, of their, of, of their sex and, and, and black workers because of the color of their skin. There can't be any, any progress without that recognition. Okay. Are you, you okay for a couple more questions? On the time? Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can find a couple of for you. Um, oh, I've just lost my comments. Oh, um, oh, where's it gone? Sorry, apologies. One day we'll be able to run one of these um, yeah, no, it's without like, technical difficulties. Yeah. Tell me about technical difficulties. Um, okay, there was a question about um, someone wanted to go back to, you said that you had a criticism of Engels. Mm -hmm. Could you just briefly go over what the bit was that you criticised? Oh, it, it was really on the question of the working class family. His analysis of the origin of the family was quite correctly based on um, uh, on property, private property, and the appropriation of private property by by men, um, and their desire then to ensure that they could pass on that property to their male sons of undisputed parentage. So my Question the point is that how does that, how how could that possibly be relevant um, to the existence of the working class family who have the property? Um, and I'm not saying that he discounted the working class family, but I don't think his analysis, and well, that's really what half this lecture was about, uh, that tried to see what what um, what its role was because clearly it has survived, and I think it's partly to do with um, ruling class ideology, but partly to do with all the stuff that I mentioned about its, its role in uh, maintaining and reproducing labour power. Because if you just took the logic of his argument, then for workers, the family has got no meaning. There is no property to inherit. And actually the same issue, well, I could say the same thing issue arose in, in, in uh, after the Russian Revolution, um, when the um, people like Kolontai and Krupskaya um, advanced the most, well, really enacted some of the most um, progressive family laws, uh, they allowed uh, um, the first country in the world really to have legalized, um, or well, divorce was just almost automatically. They talked about the socialization of housework and made massive inroads into that. Um, I'm not saying it all lasted, but you know, that the uh, Lenin talked about uh, housework as being petty, stultifying, and degrading. Um, it's always done by women. Um, uh, and that for women to be liberated, they have to be liberated from all those, those, those uh, the ties that bound them to the home. Um, I think that. It, 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 Engels, Engels, that's what Engels w w talked about. He did talk about the socialization of housework, but he's kind of skipped a stage because he assumed that everything would be okay when women entered massively into social production. But it, cause it actually, what that meant was that it exacerbated the contradictions for women. Then said, of course, that those, all those questions wouldn't be resolved until socialism, which is true. But I think that his his um, his lack of analysis of the working class family um, really um, uh, did not cannot and did not explain why the family survived um, and it still does, even though, in his terms, the material basis for its existence doesn't exist. My argument is that there is a material basis of the existence of the family. It's not just based on property. It's based on all these other things to do with the, the re production, reproduction of labor power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, wonderful, Mary. I think we'll leave you there because time's pushing on. Um, can, I, can I thank you, Mary, for um, your lecture and for answering those questions?
Um, I think most people would, would agree with me that there was um, it was enlightening tonight, and and, and hopefully it's made us go away and read some other uh, materials on this, including, of course, if I give a shameless plug to your own book that's just been republished, Women in Class, yeah? Um, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Can I just say, uh, before we go, uh, can I just mention to everyone, of course, this evening, this was co-hosted by uh, both the Marx Memorial Library and the Working Class Movement Library, and both both libraries uh, during the uh, the current crisis, the pandemic, the plague, whatever you want to call it, has what's his name continued uh, to provide um, a number of webinars and um, events for people to watch. And hope hopefully, what I'd like I hope you, you do is that you visit uh, the websites and see what events are coming up. Um, I haven't got time to um, to talk about them all tonight, otherwise we'll be here till 10 o'clock. Uh, but can I just mention a couple of things? The, the, the Work Class Movement Library has just launched its Radical Reader, um, where we're asking people to become a Radical Reader and donate some money to the library. And there is some wonderful T-shirts on offer, uh, which I would recommend, um, which are modelled on the uh, website by Maxine P. Uh, Maxine is a great friend of both libraries, and that gives me a nice link into uh, the meeting uh, that the Marx Memorial Library are having next next Thursday at the same time as this uh, to launch its patron scheme. And Maxine will be in discussion uh, with John McDonnell about the the role of the library and uh, the reason why we need to support the library. And I'm going to finish on that. So thanks, Mary, again. Thank you for. And the librarians of both libraries for helping us set this up, and Jonathan um, for fighting with the technical issues, and, and of course Mary for the lecture. And thank you, thank everybody for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you got something from it, and I hope to see you again. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you.